Vanakkam Doha Deva and everyone. Nice to be with you. Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu Ma Bindishavahai Om Shanti Shanti, Shanti. The song reminded me of Vaikasam Vasakam's coming up in about a week. Sounded like that was what the song was about. So feels like it's going to be a powerful one. Take advantage, find some festival to attend. Okay, so share. There it is, first topic. We are sharing the first topic. Answering questions. Got some more great questions to answer today. This is an unusual question. Should seekers ignore Nirvikalpa Samadhi as it is inevitable? Okay. Well, we better start with the definition here. Mighty Academy Lexicon on definition of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the realization of the self, Parashiva, state of oneness, beyond all change or diversity, beyond time, form, and space. Or said simply, in Gurudev's teachings, Nirvikalpa Samadhi is the highest form of Samadhi. Interesting quote from Yoga Swami. I climb Mount Everest in three days. There, there is nothing, no sun, no moon. Then you come down and there is Dharma, Adharma, and all things. So, of course, he's not talking about the physical Mount Everest. He's talking about the inner chakras, climbing up the ladder of the inner chakras. At the top, there's nothing. And then you have to come down in order to be in the realm of Dharma, Adharma, and all things. So, okay, this explains that. Got an interesting picture. All the camps on the way up. So there's base camp, and then there's camp one, camp two, three, four, five, six. You have six different camps you stop at on the way up to the summit of Mount Everest. So I take Yoga Swami's statement about climbing Mount Everest as referring to as attaining Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And then we have a quote from Gurudeva on, on that. Does self-realization bring bliss to the realized one? Self-realization is in several stages, realizing oneself as a soul, rather than a mind, an intellectual and emotional type or worthless person gives satisfaction, security, and this is a starting point. Very important to feel you're a divine being. Doesn't mean 100% of you is divine, all your thoughts are divine, all your emotions are divine. No, it means part of you is a divine being. You also are an instinctive being and an intellectual being at the same time. So our being has three aspects to it. But we want to identify as a spiritual being who temporarily has a physical and a emotional, I mean, and an instinctive being as well, which we eventually get rid of. That's how we control them ultimately. We don't have them anymore. <coughs> Realization of the self is such it ananda gives contentment, a release from all emotions and thoughts of the external world. And the nerve system responds to the energies flowing through the Vishuddha and Anahata chakras. That's the second one. Realization of the self is such it ananda, contentment. Realizing the self that transcends time, form, and space, Parashiva is a razor-edged experience cutting all bonds. 
reversing individual awareness, such as looking out from the self rather than looking into the self. Very subtle point there. So that's a third type of realization. A razor-edged experience. There are many boons after this transforming experience, if repeated many times. Okay, that is worth repeating. <laughs> repeating that, that has to be repeated. The fairy tale concept is, we realize the self, that's it. In fact, we might leave the earth at that very moment and we're never reborn again. That's all we have to do is, is realize Parashiva once. Not so. There's a gradual maturing or transformation that takes place. There are many boons after this transforming experience, if repeated many times. One or two occurrences does make a renunciate out of the person, does make the world renounce the renunciate. But then, without persistent effort, former patterns of emotion, intellect, lack of discipline, which would inhibit the repeated experience of Parashiva, would produce a disoriented nomad, so to speak. <clears throat> Therefore, repeated experiences of the ego-destructive Parashiva from all states of consciousness, intellectual, instinctive, even in dreams, permeates the transformation through atoms and molecules, even in the physical body. It is then that the bliss can be enjoyed of Satchit Ananda, and simultaneously, I would say, Satchit Ananda and the rough, unrelenting, timeless, formless, spaceless Parshiva merge in a not merging way, such as light and darkness in the same room, meaning they're coexisting, but they're distinct. This is different from the concept of Sayuja Samadhi, which is maintaining the perpetual bliss within the fourth and fifth chakra and stimulating the sixth and seventh. For this to be maintained, a certain isolation from worldly affairs and distracting influences is required to prevent the reawakening of previously unsatisfied desires. Repressed tendencies are unresolved subconscious conflicts. Someone asked, if realization in and of itself is not blissful, then what impels a soul that has arrived at bliss to strive for further realizations? Why don't we stop at the base camp? instead of trying to climb the summit. We are all moving forward to our ultimate goal of merging with Shiva. Bliss quiets the senses, meaning Satchitananda. It is a natural state of the mind when unperturbed by previous desires unfulfilled, desires yet to be fulfilled, and the desires not known, and the desires known to not be fulfillable. Long as the Anahata and Vishuddha chakras spin the top velocity, the senses will be quieted, few thoughts will pass through the mind unbidden. And the understanding of the Vedas and all aspects of esoteric knowledge will be able to be explained by the preceptor. Many choose to remain here as the explainers of the inexplainable and not go on deep into the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th chakras into the beyond of the beyond. So once you go beyond the 7th, you're in the very subtle ones above the Sarasvara. <clears throat> The quantum level, the core of the universe itself, there comes a point when the powers of evolution move one forward, and even these desireless ones desire the greatest unfoldment once they have found out that it is there to be desired. Realizing Parshiva is merging with Shiva, but it is not the end of merging. At that pinpoint of time, there are still the trappings of body, mind, and emotions that claim awareness into their consciousness. Ultimately, when all bodies, physical, astral, mental, even the soul body, wear out their time, as all forms wear out in time, bound by time, existing in time as relative realities, then Vishvagrasa, the final merger with Shiva, occurs as the physical body drops away. The astral body drops away, the mental body drops away, and the soul, a shining, scintillating being of light quantums, merges into its source. As when a drop of water merges into the ocean, it can never be retrieved. Only Shiva remains. So we'll come back to our question. Probably all forgot it. I forgot it. <clears throat> That's why it's here again. Should seekers ignore Nirvikalpa Samadhi as it is inevitable? I think we can compare it to being at the base camp for Mount Everest. 
which is an, an, at an elevation of 5,360 meters and wanting to be at the summit. Mount Everest Peak is the highest altitude above mean sea level at 8,848 meters, which is an additional 3,488 meters, which is about two miles further up that mountain. Clearly, it takes skill and concerted effort to reach the peak. If you're at the base camp and you want to get to the top, it takes skill and concerted effort and a good guide as well. Likewise, to attain Nirvikalpa Samadhi requires the same, skill and concerted effort. So the answer to the question is, can we, it, will it just happen by itself? Isn't it natural? And the answer is no. Just like getting from the base camp to the summit of Mount Everest. Will it happen by itself? No. It takes a lot of skill and effort, and once you get there, it takes some uh, preparation to hold that, hold that austerity. As Gurudeva says, it's very intense, and it's not at all bliss-like. Second question is about affirmations. For answering it, I wanted to review the basic of using affirmations. And that's, that's a question to you. What are the three keys to effectively utilizing affirmations? They're one word, keys. If you use all three, then the affirmations work better. <clears throat> Gurudeva gives us a very important key to being successful in affirmation. It is when repeating the affirmations to simultaneously think, visualize, and feel what the affirmation is manifesting. Let's look more closely at these three aspects of affirmations with the example of, I can, I will, I am able to accomplish what I plan. <coughs> Think means consciously being aware of what the affirmation means. When we are fully focused on what we are saying, we know what it means. But it is easy when you do an affirmation many times a day. After a while, your mind is thinking about something else. What am I going to eat for breakfast? Are there any chocolates left? Your mind has become divided. If we have a divided mind, if we are thinking about something else at the same time, we are doing the affirmation. We are not grasping the meaning. We're just repeating the affirmation out of habit. Visualize means to create a mental picture illustrating information. We need to picture something in our mind, which is an illustration, just like drawing on paper, that illustrates the concepts in the affirmation. We need to hold this visualization at the same time as we are understanding what the words mean. We can change the visualization now and then. It doesn't always have to be the same one. That, again, keeps it from becoming a habit and are not thinking about it. An example of a visualization for the affirmation, I can, I will, I am able to accomplish what I plan, is to see yourself sitting at a desk, planning the remodeling of a room in your home, followed by the image of doing the carpentry for the room. Feel means to have the same feeling you will have when this is consistently happening in your life. In the case of this affirmation, it is the feelings of confidence and success from being able to accomplish what you plan. You need to feel now how you will feel in the future when you are successful and confident. Maybe you don't know how it will feel. Maybe you never felt that way. So you have to make a leap. Find those feelings of confidence and success and have those present while we are doing the affirmation. This is the part that people sometimes leave out because they don't realize its importance. Find those feelings of confidence and success. 
Okay, so now we get some specific questions on this affirmation. Regarding the affirmation, I can, I will, I'm able to accomplish what I plan. Is it always advisable to say this affirmation in conjunction with a specific plan? It is not required. It's never required to do a visualization. However, as a general rule, a specific plan or visualization helps the affirmation work better. What is the difference between the words can and able? Is will used in the sense of using willpower to persist in spite of obstacles, or is it is used in the sense of agreement, commitment like a promise? So I don't see any difference between can and able. Will is used in the sense of a firm commitment to accomplish something. It is the difference between saying, I am able to do this today versus I will do this today. So you're making a commitment to actually do it. A firm commitment. Next question relates to this affirmation. I am the complete master of all of my forces. My spiritual energies govern and control the force fields wherever I am for the highest good. When we say I, are we saying this is I, a divine soul, or is our physical astral and soul bodies all together? I as a divine soul is how we're saying it. Throughout our studies, there are references to many kinds of forces, such as odic, actinic, passive, aggressive, positive, negative, beneficial, superconscious, the 18 predominant mind forces working within the mind consciousness, 12 few meditations, and many others. What are forces? How should we think about them, visualize, and feel them for this affirmation? Okay, so we're answering the question, what are forces? What does forces mean in the context of this affirmation and not answering it in a any broader sense. This affirmation states, I am the complete master of all of my forces. We can therefore say it is referring to our physical, emotional, intellectual, and intuitive forces. As energy moves into those areas, we control it. For example, physical, we don't eat too much. Emotional, we don't get angry. Intellectual, we don't argue. Get stuck in opinionated knowledge. Intuitive, we do use our intuition to provide answers. So those are ways of controlling the forces in those four, in those four aspects of our being. Next question is on the second half of the affirmation. My spiritual energies govern and control the force fields wherever I am for the highest good. Same question holds for spiritual energies and force fields. Do spiritual energies govern and control in the sense of exercising one's spiritualized willpower or do they control in a more passive sense of trusting Constantly adjusting forces are keeping everything in balance, that there is not one wrong thing. So my answer is a little different than the structure of the, the answer that, that comes with the question. Force fields are controlled both passively and actively. For example, the presence of a person who is deep within improves the force field of the room without the person doing anything. Gurudeva walks into a room, force field improves passive. He hasn't done anything. If one or more people in the room performed a puja, that would be actively controlling the force fields. So we can control a force field both passively and actively. Passively to me means just the state of mind someone is in is influencing the force field of the room in which they are. That's passive. Active means they're doing something. They're not just sitting and doing nothing. And what they're doing is impacting the force field. Okay, then we get a different question altogether. What is the nature of the world? Good, evil, or other? How would you answer that question?
The answer I like to give is that the world is subjective, which is part of the other. It's not good, it's not evil, it's other, it's subjective. To different people, it appears completely different. To the businessman, clearly, it is a place to make money. What else? To the scientist, a place to make a new discovery. To a, a teenager, at least some teenagers, a place to party on the weekend. And to the spiritual seeker, it is an ashram. So it's totally subjective, as the picture shows there. <clears throat> Think of a supermarket. When a health-conscious vegetarian goes shopping, she ignores most of the items and just focuses on the healthy vegetarian ones. Likewise, in the world, focus on those aspects of it that help you become more spiritual and ignore the rest. So we don't get upset when we go to the supermarket and think it's evil just because there's a section with meat in it. <laughs> just ignore it. You probably don't even walk through it. Yes, we have to. So we have a pub desk on this. World is an ashram. Two thousand and six. This publisher's desk was written in response to encountering some Hindus who held the perspective that the world was a worldly place and was to be avoided and was a distraction from making spiritual progress. This article shows that that is not the perspective of great souls and that in fact, with a change of perspective, much spiritual progress can be made during our time in the world. So it's all in our perspective. So our beliefs create our attitudes and our attitudes are our perspectives. In Hinduism, we are fortunate to have many God-realized souls to guide us along the spiritual path their teachings are so profound and powerful that they penetrate our normal consciousness and give us new insights into how to live to maximize our spiritual progress. Paramaguru Yoga Swami gave us one such gem when he said, The world is an ashram, a training ground for the achievement of freedom. Each one does his part according to his own measure. There is nothing that is evil. For the achievement of so freedom here is a translation of moksha. Okay, Swami's statement has a parallel in William Shakespeare's play, As You Like It. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. Seven ashramas. <laughs> so we paraphrase Shakespeare. All the world is an ashram, and all the men and women are divine souls. They are spiritually maturing through earthly experiences. And one soul in its time takes many births, and thus evolves into oneness with God. Let's look more closely at what it means to say all the world is an ashram. An ashram, of course, is the residence and teaching center of a swami or spiritual preceptor. It is a place we go to learn about our religion and make spiritual progress. When we go out the door of our home to go to work, school, or elsewhere, do we have in mind that we are going to an ashram? That our actions during the day in the office, factory, hospital, classroom, or elsewhere will help us evolve spiritually and bring us closer to moksha? Probably not. When we come home and reflect back on the day, do we feel we made spiritual progress while out of the home? Again, probably not. Why is this? It is because we have not been trained to look at life in this way. We think of the ashram as a place of spiritual advancement and we regard the world as a place of mundane tasks and distractions from our spiritual work. According to this thinking, we make progress in an ashram but not when we are in the world. This common perspective is not the viewpoint of great souls such as Yoga Swami. Such souls know that the world is a subjective place which can be dark and negative or the source of much joy and spiritual progress. 
And, of course, we only need to hold the right perspective, seeing things in the right way. I call this approaching spiritualizing. I call this approach spiritualizing daily life. Let's bring this concept down to earth by dividing the occasions for spiritual progress when out in the world into two categories. Facing life's challenges and finding opportunities to serve. Think of them as two paths leading you towards spiritual maturity. First, let's take a few minutes to explore how we face life's challenges. You know from experience that life is going to come at you whether you want it to or not. Joyful, easy times, difficult times, happy days and sad, it is all coming. It is all there in your karma. It can't help but come. So you don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to go to try and do something different. You can't avoid it. You can't hide from it. Life challenges will come to us. What is going to happen is going to happen. But where the focus should be for those on the spiritual path is on how we respond to the obstacles it faces. Why? Because that is where we have a choice. Different people will respond differently to the same experience. For example, the small infant keeps us awake all night by crying. How do we respond to it? Does it upset us? Do we feel stressed or do we just accept it and respond back with lots of love? In every experience of life, we have control over our response. It can be impulsive or thoughtful. It's our choice. <clears throat> when accused of something that we didn't do, how do we respond? When we face challenges at work, for example, our boss is unfair with us, yells at us. What is our reaction? We want to yell back, but we cannot. So do we go home and yell at the spouse? In all such cases, we have choices. It's not the challenges that come, but how we face those challenges that makes the difference. <clears throat> we can react emotionally without thinking about spiritual principles. We can get angry or despondent. We can worry a lot and become irritable. Or we can decide to control any emotional reactions that we might have. We can choose to live without anger. We can choose to cultivate patience. Choose to be kinder to other people, to be more generous. That is what makes us spiritually stronger. As we curb our instinctive nature, our soul nature shines forth. In other words, if we get angry now and then, let us try and eliminate anger altogether. If we get impatient with people who seem to explain things at great lengths when they could be explained in a short way, Let's learn how not to get impatient. Let us learn to accept that verbosity is their nature. That can be a hard one. Here is a list of six common challenges we face in life that provide us with good opportunities for spiritual progress if we respond in a wise manner with self-control. First common challenge is mistreatment by others. Life provides us a steady stream of experiences in which we are mistreated by others. Rather than retaliate or hold resentment, we can forgive and respond with kindness. Second common example, second common challenge is our own mistakes. When we make a major mistake, we have a choice to wallow in self-doubt and self-deprecation or to figure out how to not repeat the mistake. Very important. We want to learn from it. Otherwise, it'll happen again. Third common challenge is difficult projects. Faced with tasks that stretch our abilities, we can do the minimal just to get by. Or be inspired to do our best by looking at them as opportunities to improve our concentration, willpower, and steadfastness, all of which will enhance our meditation abilities and inner striving. Or common challenge, disturbed emotions. When we get upset by life's experiences, we have a choice to suffer the emotional upheaval or to strive to pull ourselves out of it as quickly as possible. Fifth common challenge is interpersonal conflicts. When serious disagreements, quarrels, or arguments occur, we have a choice to hold a grudge and perhaps even shun the person or to resolve the matter and keep the relationship harmonious. Six common challenges, gossip and backbiting. 
When those around us indulge in gossip, rumors, scandals, and backbiting, we have a choice to join in or to not participate. And even among those close to us, make it clear that we do not approve. Then we have the opportunities to serve, six opportunities to serve, which we did just recently, so we won't go into them. We'll just name them and keep going. Seeing God and those we greet is the first opportunity to help others. Volunteering, the second opportunity. Expressing appreciation, third opportunity. Reaching out to newcomers, fourth opportunity. Offering hospitality, fifth opportunity. Making encouraging and complimentary remarks, sixth opportunity. Summary. We have explored six ways to face life. Six ways to serve. Clearly, having a great day needs to mean more than getting a bonus at work or an A on a school test. It should include the spiritual progress you made that day through effectively facing life's challenges and the ways in which you helped and uplifted others. Our list of 12 practices is a good beginning, but hopefully you will keep expanding it as additional insights come from your striving to maximize the spiritual progress you can make from the experiences and opportunities each day brings. Also, parents can teach children to consciously strive for spiritual progress each day at school by facing life's challenges and finding opportunities to serve. So I think we'll stop there. You we'll, won't do the character building, running a little long. Okay, so...